let's review, shall we? Let's review. Uh, there were there was never a synagogue or an ecclesia at Thyatira in the first century. That's numero uno, numero dos. None of these ecclesias ever have record of being sent a letter by John. Those that did exist, if any of them existed, if any of them existed, uh, there, there was a church, yes, there was a particular synagogue. Where was it? Where was that one where they had a council? Laodicea. They had a council that Laodiceans did. And um, that was in like this third century, second, yeah, yeah third century. And uh, they searched their files. Uh, they did a search um, for, they put in um, John letter from, and there's nothing on record in Laodicea that, they ever got a record from John. And as I told you before, that would be something of note that you would put under glass and charge admission to see. Good morning, everyone. Martin Zender. A series concerning the book of the unveiling of Jesus Christ is underway, and it has been underway since September 15th of 2014. It has a conclusion, just like the eons. The eons are indistinct periods of time, generally lengthy periods of time. They have an end. And uh, this series shall also have an end. Oh, not to mention the fact that no one has ever heard of the um, Lycanaeatans. No, the Lycanaeatans are unknown to history. The, Nicol the Nicolaitans are also, but the Lycanaeatans, they are a special breed. They're a cult apart, and they have become the stuff of legend. They have become the stuff of speculation. Christians have speculated, who are the Lycanaitans? And they have never concluded anything. Why? Well, because no one's ever heard of them. That's because they're future. That's because they're future. You put these three things together, and only these three things, uh, you may, I'll go ahead and add to the cocktail the fact that John went to be in the Lord's day when he was instructed to write to these ecclesias. And something tells me that these ecclesias will be in the Lord's day. I'm just smart that way. Now, I'm going to go on and continue to riff. I am riffing on the ecclesias. I'm buzzing through them. I left off with that wonderful young lady, Jezebel, the falseness of those who present themselves to Israel as something, as I'm a prophetess. Oh, and I'm of the synagogue of Jesus. No, you're the synagogue of Satan. Hey, prophetess, you're a seductress who are leading the people astray, much as uh, Balak led Balaam astray, or vice versa. Or, yeah, they both contributed to that. And it's all a matter of putting stumbling blocks in front of Israel, as I said. And a stumbling, it's so easy. The stumbling blocks are so easy to put in front of Israel and us, really. And I think many of the people who left Paul in Paul's extremity when he was in prison in Rome, they did so because of some stumbling block. And it doesn't have to be anything more complicated than, than someone had a job opportunity. Someone could have been staying with Paul, but they said, oh, we had this great job opportunity and uh, we're tired of hanging out with this jailbird. And uh, Paul is spoken of um, evilly everywhere. And so we are going to uh, discard him. And that's as simple as it gets. It doesn't necessarily... These people that forsook Paul doesn't necessarily mean that they stopped being believers. They just gave up their allotment. They said, enough of this. We're tired of it. And they and they took off. So let's continue. Uh, yeah, Jezebel. He puts out a couch for her so that, so that those who are filthy can remain filthy still. We give her great affliction. But they must be repenting of their acts. And her children shall I be killing with death. If there's anything worse than getting killed. It's getting killed with death. And this is what's going to happen to the children of the seductors. That is those who carry on the traditions of their forefathers. And most Israelites can't help it. Somehow it's in their blood. I guess the great degree to which they are experts at um, becoming great in this world and leading things and leading people. Uh, to that degree, they are deceived because it becomes such a so in front of their face how great they are boy are we good boy are we uh, efficient boy are we entrepreneurial boy can we start a company and so this becomes a snare and a stumbling block to them even david said let their table become a snare to them paul repeats this i believe it's in or if it's not in romans chapter 11 it's in romans chapter 9 what does he mean let their table become a snare food a table speaks of food 
And it is easy for food to become a snare to anyone. It becomes like the centerpiece of, of your life. These are things that happen. So we're killing them with death. And the Ecclesia shall know that I am he who is searching the kidneys and hearts. Well, don't get anatomical on me here. This is a metaphor. The kidneys and the hearts are the essential parts of humanity. The kidneys and the hearts. He doesn't. God doesn't just search the outward. This is the opposite of someone who says they're a prophetess, but they're really a seductor. Uh, and by someone who says they're of the synagogue of Jesus, but they're the synagogue of Satan. This is the opposite. God searches the hearts. We know that the breath of humanity is the spirit of God searching the innermost parts of the being. So God looks, and Jesus did this, of course, when he was on earth. Jesus did not entrust himself to many people because he knew the hearts of people and he would not be uh, deceived by any outward show of affection when it betrayed an inward diabolicalness. Searching the kidneys and the hearts, I will be giving to each of you in accord with your acts. This is what is being written and being said via the pen of John to the Ecclesia at, who are these people? The Thyatirans, the Thyatirans. They will be paid in accord with their acts. And this is a way with Israel. Somebody asked me yesterday, what's the main difference between, doesn't Israel have grace? What's the main difference between them and us? Yes, Israel has grace, but it is grace mixed with works. It is presented as grace mixed with works. We are unalloyed grace, unadulterated, pure and holy transcendent grace. It's called the transcendent grace of God. It never is that adjective transcendent used in front of the word grace ever in scripture except with Paul. The transcendent grace of God to distinguish it from the ordinary grace of God, from the run-of-the-mill grace of God that would be mixed with works. Now, I will be paying you in accord with your acts. We will find this also at the Great White Throne where God repays people in accord with their acts. Uh, a verse is coming to mind here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 uh, that will distinguish our gospel from what I just read to you. Uh, and that is... Paul says he wants Timothy to suffer evil with the evangel. I'm in 1 8, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Suffer evil with the evangel in accord with the power of God who saves us and calls us with a holy calling, not in accord with our acts, but in accord with his own purpose and the grace which is given to us in Christ Jesus before times aeonian, before the eons even began. We had a grace in Christ Jesus, and this is not in accord with our acts. How could it be when he calls us before we had done any acts? Before we have done anything good or bad, we are called with a holy calling. That is, is a separation. God is separating us for his purposes. And so this is a great thing, and it's so the opposite. How opposite can you get called not in accord with our acts? And here Jesus says, I will be paying you in accord with your acts. Back to Revelation chapter 2. Now you... Now to you am I saying to the rest in Thyatira, whoever have not this teaching, who do not know the deep things of Satan, as they are saying, that I will be casting on you no other burden. <laughs> That's all we have to say at this time. Uh, thank God that there are some there who do not know the deep things of Satan. I like that. They're innocent. They're naive. And it's good to be naive of the deep things of Satan, as they are saying um, as they are saying, people are repeating the deep things of Satan, disguising it as light, of course. Uh, moreover, what you have hold until the time whenever I should be arriving. Now, I don't know anything about poker. I'm not a card player. It's too technical for me. I can't figure it out. I can't you know, keep track of cards, what's played and everything. There's something called Texas Hold'em. I don't know what that is for sure, except I see the word hold in there. And I'm thinking that you, if you have good cards, you hold them. I know there's a Kenny Rogers song. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. So I made the connection with Kenny Rogers, know when to hold them. He's talking about a card player and um, Texas hold them. It must have something to do where if you have a hand, a killer hand, you discard certain cards that are terrible and you hold cards. And this is an exhortation to the church at Thyatira, the Ecclesia there. Hold what you have, what you have hold, because you can 
unhand it. You cannot continue to hold it. And I'm going to use this for you. I'm going to use this for you, telling you to hold on fast to that which you have. Do not give up the expectation of your calling. Do not, because again, it is more valuable than Apple stock in 1979 or Microsoft stock in 1974. Do not, do not give away what you have. Don't be like Esau, who sold his birthright for a temporary advantage. And to the one who is conquering and keeping my acts until the consummation, to him will I be giving authority over the nation. So here's one of those things where uh, there's a difference between somebody who gets a participation trophy for making it into the kingdom. It's a great thing. Congratulations. Uh, there's a difference between that and having authority, being given authority over the nations. This comes to those who are enduring and who are going ahead to the consummation. We have an, analog an analogous a situation in our evangel in that salvation comes to all irrespective of our acts. And yet Paul talks about pushing on. He talks about racing, talks about running a race, talks about gaining a wreath of righteousness, reaching maturity, all these things above and beyond the basic call of salvation looking forward to something greater than salvation that is to have an allotment of life and to be ruling and reigning with christ we can be we can be let go from this appointment yes if we give up he gives up on us second timothy chapter 2 i've read this to you many times only in the sense of reigning ruling and reigning with him he cannot disown himself we are members of his body you can't disown your own body at least jesus can't we can maybe cut off a leg cut off a hand you know god forbid but the body of Christ is secure. You cannot lose it. Where was I? Oh, yes. Authority over the nations. He shall be shepherding them with an iron club as vessels of pottery are being crushed. And I also have obtained from my father and I will give him the morning star. I used to hear a lot of this morning star thing in kingdom circles and i suppose you can go into all sorts of details but i am skimming the forest here which really possibly brings you better information because so many people get lost in the trees and they start analyzing the bark they start nibbling on it like a bunch of termites and they regurgitate it and pretty soon you don't know what they're talking about because they it's so esoteric and mind numbingly subjective i am going way up over the trees giving you the overlay here morning star i don't think it's anything more than the dawning of the kingdom the morning star jesus christ is the star morning is the dawn of the new day it's the dawning of the age of aquarius you see even in popular culture john lennon imagine there's no whatever and then the age of aquarius this whole new age thing is a false um presupposition it's a false narrative that would push on you a truth prematurely it would take something that is going to happen the human heart longs for this utopia the human heart longs for whatever john lennon's singing about there no countries and imagine there's no heaven and no hell beneath us well i i can dig that part of it i can certainly dig that part of it but um the rest of it john it's quite um in the sky and it is still yet i'll give credit to mr lennon and anyone else who wants to sing about um utopia it's in the human heart to long for this but just as with drugs you take drugs and it gives you a premature experience of glory and of liberation and um, it might be a taste but it's illicit and to prove that it's illicit if you use too much of it you lose your mind yeah, we lost our minds on LSD for a while. We got it from our dentist, slipped some in our tea. Next thing you know, the lift was on fire. Yeah, so people experiment with it and can't say I blame them because life is hard. But um, this whole idea of utopia is a dream. It, it's something implanted in the human heart and it's a good thing except when you do not realize that it is future and it comes not by might not by power not by flower power either uh, but by jesus christ 
Jesus Christ is the only one that's going to bring a utopia on earth. It's a 1,000 year kingdom. Now look at this. Look at this. Who has an ear, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the Ecclesia. You know, I think about this ear thing, and if you look back at the secrets of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, yet to those without it has not been given. And he says, and Paul says that they have been, that Israel specifically has been given ears that do not hear, eyes that do not see to this very day. Why? Because God himself has given them a spirit of stupor. I got to tell you this, last night, um, Juliana says, what series do I watch next, Martin? I've watched the the Brazilian series. And boys, those, the, those Brazilians, they know how to do cereals. Uh, I'm not talking about cornflakes here or sugar puffs. I'm talking about Bible stories like soap operas having to do with the Bible. The first one was about um, Joseph. The second one was about Moses. And the third one was about Jericho coming into the promised land. Joshua, I guess, would have been the star of that show. And she goes, what do I do next? I said, David, you have to find something on David. So she found a series on King David and she's watching it. Very interested in biblical things. And she did tell me, I've got to finish reading your book, First Idiot in Heaven. I said, yes, you must finish reading it. It's very important. And so, but she came... Uh, showed up in front of my door last night was very frustrated so what's the matter with israel they are so ugly they're so evil they're so mean god must be beside himself he must be so frustrated these people are so stupid isn't that interesting like she's coming into this stuff experientially by watching a series and i said well yes i mean god yeah god comes across as frustrated yeah, because it's hard to explain it, right? To somebody who's never heard of it, he's condescending to communicate with human beings. But I grabbed my scriptures and I turned to Romans 9 and I said, look. No, I turned to Romans 11. It's God himself who has given this people a spirit of stupor. So it's not like God's panicking, Julian. It's not like God is wringing his hands beside himself. Whenever it comes across like he's having a a discussion stroking his beard sipping a tea with his creation it is a figure of speech called condescension but no don't worry this situation is going to end and then i read to her romans 11 at the end there 25 and 26 uh, that all israel shall be saved and she was a little taken aback and she goes well that's a nice thought i said it's not a thought it's not, i didn't dream this up it's in the Bible, Joanna, reading you a verse from the Bible. It was, this was just last night. I'm sitting over here. She's standing over there. All Israel shall be saved. But see, I said God has to bring this people to their knees. He has to totally exhaust their self-supports. He has to totally exhaust their confidence in the flesh. And for Israel... That's a tough nut to crack, kind of like those coconuts out there that the Cubans knocked down from our tree. You need a machete to get the mm, water out of it. Well, with Israel, it takes the tribulation to get the water of life out of them. But I told her that that was the plan, and it settled her down. I didn't want her to think that God was in a freak-out mode. God was somehow out of control of his situation. But it, it is tricky because you see verses where God appears to be wrestling. So this needs to be explained to people. All right. I'm going to start uh, tomorrow with chapter 3 to the messenger of the Ecclesia at Sardis. Sardis. We're going to learn about Sardis tomorrow. And I'm going to learn because this is what I'm doing this week with you. This is what I'm doing. I'm not looking ahead of time. I haven't really read these uh, passages for a couple of months. So I'm not even going ahead of time to plan out what I'm going to do. I am purposely waiting until I hit the on button on this computer and on this microphone before I even look at this. And so you're getting, this is a new way to get impressions from me. Don't try this at home. Do not try this at home. This is not for beginners. Okay. You have to have a depth of knowledge in the scriptures and the depth of experience before you can you can riff accurately. I mean, you can try it. You can try it. But I don't recommend it. I don't recommend such feats of daring do. Uh, 
The Wallendas, of course, used to walk a tightrope. Philippe Petit, at one time in the 70s, strung a tightrope across the World Trade Centers and walked across it. We're not taking those kinds of risks here. I'm not crazy. I'm an expositor of the word, but I am not crazy. I will not leave my normal mind. <clears throat> I will not go on any Pentecostal cartwheels here. No mental gymnastics <clears throat> as I try to <clears throat> strain out some new and interesting thing you've never heard before. No, we're keeping our regular minds here because that's all we got. And we're looking at the word of God and the spirit of God that is in us. We are an answer to Paul's prayer. Paul says, I pray that you come to a realization of the truth, to a mature man in Christ Jesus, man and woman, to a mature human being in Christ Jesus. So Paul would have us come to maturity. All the word is for us, but it's not all to us. The book of the unveiling of Jesus Christ is not to us, but it's for us because we are mining gems from this book. And to that, I can only thank, attribute our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for making it alive to us and at the same time helping us to distinguish those things that differ.